Good morning from Rome. Happy St. Joseph's Day. I'm Colleen Carroll Campbell. Well, the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, and the vast crowds are gathering. And in the next few hours, we will witness Pope Francis installed as the 267th Bishop of Rome and pastor of the Universal Church. Joining us to witness history being made today is Father Raymond D'Souza and Joan Lewis. Father, what can we expect to see and hear today? Well, it's a grand, grand ceremony, the beginning of the Pope's Petri ministry. Uh, a Pope becomes Pope at the very instant that he accepts his election in the conclave. So it's not like a diocesan bishop who comes at a certain point and then the, the documents are read and then he's installed. So he's already, he's been Bishop of Rome and he's been Pope since Wednesday evening. But there's this great mass in which we call that he begins his ministry, it's to inaugurate his ministry as Bishop of Rome, Bishop of this local church, and then also pastor of the Universal Church as successor of St. Peter. So he will receive the symbols of his office in the same way that a bishop might receive a mitre or a crozier at his ordination. Uh, the Pope will receive the fisherman's ring. He'll receive the pallium, which is his symbol of being a metropolitan bishop. And then he, it's his first chance to speak in a liturgical way. He's been speaking the last few days. We've seen on EWTN in our coverage here. But he speaks in a, in a liturgical way to the whole church. And um, this was the famous homily in 1978, where John Paul gave his Be Not Afraid homily of uh, October 22nd, 1978. So it can also be a memorable occasion, but it's his, it's, it's his first chance uh, to speak to the church from the church. You know, when he speaks in the uh, Apostolic Palace to the Cardinals, when he greets foreign dignitaries as yesterday, it's not that full sense of speaking from the mass to the massed people here. There's an enormous crowd. So it really is the public beginning of his ministry as a successor of St. Peter, and it begins well, this morning the Pope's going to do a little bit of a tour around the, the square, but it begins with him praying at the tomb of St. Peter. So he in St. Peter's Basilica, underneath the great Baldacchino Bernini, the great papal altar, right underneath that is the tomb of St. Peter, and that's where Francis will begin the day praying there in front of Peter, and then he comes out to begin his ministry as successor of St. Peter. And Joan, I just want to give folks a sense of the atmosphere here. We can hear the helicopters whirring overhead. The streets are packed, a lot of security. Uh, we're hearing estimates of a million or more pilgrims today. And over our shoulder, we can hear this angelic choir singing. So there's a great deal of historic import, liturgical import, as Father Raymond was saying. And you've been here for these occasions before. Tell us what this means uh, to here in Rome and to pilgrims around the world. Well, to the Romans, uh, Francis is their bishop, mm -hmm. as, as has been uh, pointed out. And the official name of the ceremony today is the beginning of the Petrine ministry of the Bishop of Rome. They made that very clear mm -hmm. at the press conference yesterday because it's no longer a crowning with the papal uh, triple tiara. And that hasn't been done for 50 years since um, Paul VI in, mm -hmm. in, um, in 1963. So it's a ceremony that is going to be simple like Francis. We've mm. already had some indications of that. And I think the people are yearning to see their bishop and uh, say mass, celebrate mass. But to me, the most astonishing thing certainly was, as you said, the uh, the massive amount of security. Mm. If there is someone wearing a uniform in Italy, they are somewhere <laughs> on, on the street around here. Right. And the only vehicles that I saw allowed were all police vehicles, police motorcycles. Mm -hmm. The official cars with the delegations, this is interesting, they don't have to go through these barriers. The Perugino Gate is a little known gate in the south wall of Vatican City. I, I do I often go in there for like daily mass at St. Peter's and um, that's where all the official cars will go in. They will leave off their head of delegation. They will go through the basilica and generally come through the basilica to their to the point where they have to be seated. But the security is massive and interestingly enough I learned this morning that the subway in Rome is free. No tickets mm -hmm. needed today from 530 to 2 mm -hmm. to allow people to get here. Because and, and so many other means of transportation are closed. But the, the heartwarming thing is to see people get up so early, fight so many battles as they did the other day, even in rain and everything, mm -hmm. to see their pastor. Mm -hmm. It's it's very, very moving. It's beautiful. And I thank God for the lovely weather for, <laughs> for <laughs> hundreds, us too. Yeah. Of, hundreds of thousands. We don't have rain beating on our back. Yeah, and yes, absolutely. It's wonderful. Uh, Father Raymond, this is, of course, St. Joseph's Day, as we mentioned, which is a very important feast here in Italy. And uh, we see a symbol of St. Joseph on our new Pope's crest. Can you tell us a bit? 
bit about that? Yes, well, the Cardinals and the uh, Holy Father himself had a bit of a problem because, you know, this conclave came right smack in the middle of Lent. Right. And normally they wait till the next Sunday. So uh, Pope was elected on Wednesday. It would have been quick. It would have been a little bit fast to get it on Sunday. We also had the marathon in Rome. That would have been another logistical problem. Uh, so we had this great providence that the Feast of St. Joseph falls in this week. Um, the Cardinals can be here with the Holy Father today, then they can get home for Holy Week. St. Joseph is the patron and protector of the Universal Church, so his patronage is partly to protect the Church in the same way that he protected Our Lady and the infant Jesus growing up. So, protector of the Holy Church, it's a beautiful day for the past for the Church to be inaugurated. And in fact, many bishops, if they're, if they're nominated sometime in January or February, might choose this day anyway for an ordination. Now, on his crest, so his coat of arms, um, Pope Francis chose, as did Benedict and as did John Paul, to keep the same one he had when he was an uh, archbishop. So in this case, the archbishop of Buenos Aires. And on that crest, it's, it's basically a blue shield uh, for Our Lady. And then on that, there are three images, Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. There's the IHS, which is the Greek letters for the name of Jesus. And that is the symbol, especially dear to the uh, Jesuits, the holy name of Jesus. So Jesus is on the top in the IHS. And then we have a image, a star, a five-pointed star, which represents Our Lady. And then something called a spike nard, which is not something that we often use that word in English, but it's a kind of um, grapes on the vine, it looks like. And that's a symbol of St. Joseph. So uh, a long, long time ago, when uh, in 1998 or 1992, I guess, when uh, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio, Bishop Bergoglio, who first became a bishop, he chose that crest, and he chose to have Jesus, Mary, and Joseph symbolized there. And so I'm sure for him, the Feast of St. Joseph was an obvious uh, choice. And interestingly enough, there are, as you'd imagine, special readings for the Feast of, or rather, the inauguration of a pontificate. You know, Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. But Francis, because of the feast day, because of Joseph as protector of the Church Universal, because of his own devotion to St. Joseph, decided to use the readings for the Mass of St. Joseph. Mm. So we're actually going to hear the Gospel, not you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, but the angel coming to Matthew and saying, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And then he got up and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. So uh, very strong Joseph uh, themes, Mar Marian themes, Holy Family themes here on his uh, first, not first day as Pope, but his first inaugural day of the beginning of his Petrine ministry. And, and something I found very telling on the Pope's coat of arms is mm. that there is no pallium at mm. the very bottom of the, there's the cross keys, mm -hmm. um, silver and gold, and then there's the bishop's mitre on the top. Benedict removed what used to be the triple crown on the top of the crest. But um, John Paul and now Francis, neither of them have the pallium at the bottom, but Benedict did. He put the pallium in at the bottom of his crest. And any idea of the significance of that, why that decision was made? Well, the, the probably, more, probably more significant why Benedict put it there. Benedict put the pallium, that, that was a novelty to put the mm -hmm. pallium, which is that the woolen band that the Pope Francis will have imposed on him. Uh, but Benedict had that sort of hanging off the bottom of the crest. Yes. And I you can't say it was universally unpopular, but I, most people didn't seem to understand exactly why it was there. Uh, everybody knows the Bishop of Rome is already a Metropolitan Archbishop, which is the symbolism of the pallium. And at least according to me, but to many others, it looked a little strange hanging off the bottom. And, and so Francis decided like that, that that, that uh, is, won't continue. Is there anything we see either in his pallium or his crest that indicates this simplicity that's been sort of a theme of the past week? I would I would say it's you know the the, the pallium is the same the, for everyone. The, the, the pallium is the same one that uh, Benedict and John Paul wore, though there's slight differences between the color, and uh, the crest. You know, John Paul had the simplest crest of all, the simple mm -hmm. cross with the M. Uh, this has a few other symbols. I don't. Uh, I, it, I don't think there's anything particularly Franciscan about it. There is something Jesuit about it, yeah. and uh, I think the interesting thing is that it, long before he knew he was going to be pope literally 21 years ago, he chose the symbols of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, mm. and here he is being uh, installed or inaugurated as the Bishop of Rome on the Feast of St. Joseph. So I expect we'll hear some themes of that in his homily. And it's telling that he did keep the 
um, the crest, basically, that he did have his Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And, and what is so interesting, in the history of heraldry, one of the most um, important authoritative persons on earth a number of years ago was Archbishop Bruno Heim. And at one point, he was the Vatican's ambassador, the nuncio, to Great Britain. And it was John Paul, when he became pope in 78, he called Bruno Heim in, Archbishop Heim. And he said, now, you know, let's create my crest. And he had this very clear idea of the cross and the M for Mary. And so he said, kind of, here's a draft of what I want. And, uh, Archbishop Heim said, oh, I'm so sorry, Your Holiness, but we do not allow words or letters on the crest. And Pope John Paul, like he was deaf to what he'd said, uh, now here's where I would like to have the M, you know. <laughs> and he, he won that battle, and as we all know. And he put the M in. It may not be a her uh, heraldic rule, but I think a pope can do what he wishes, apparently. Father know. Raymond, um, looking at all of the significance of this regalia yes. and, and the pallium and the crest, and you know, I, I think especially non Catholics, but even many Catholics would say, why do we have all these things? Why is this important? Isn't this just sort of trivia? Or, you know, what does this do for the Holy Father? What does this do for the church that we see these symbols and we understand them? Well, first of all, I mean, it is kind of trivia, but all families have their trivia. I mean, you know, <laughs> grandmothers tell stories that are tedious and boring to everybody, but they tell them anyway because it's the family trivia. So because something's trivial doesn't mean it's not important. Um, but the symbols are that this man, the Bishop of Rome, was the successor of St. Peter. So the key things are the prayer before the tomb. So the prayer literally at the tomb of St. Peter where he was martyred. So Peter's final witness was here in Rome on the Vatican Hill where he was martyred. That's where it starts. If in fact, we could fit enough people in the basilica, the mass should take place over the tomb, and that symbolism is clear, but you can't fit, you know, 100,000 people in the basilica as large as it is. So then they come out here, and then the pallium is the symbol of the good shepherd. So Jesus is the good shepherd. So it's a symbol of the shepherd who goes in search of the lost sheep, the weak sheep, the sick, ill sheep, puts them on his shoulders and carries them. That's that woolen band. It's a symbol of a sheep on the shoulders of the good shepherd. And then the fisherman's ring. Paul, uh, Peter was a fisherman. In 2005, Pope Benedict is at his inaugural mass gave a beautiful meditation on the meaning of the fisherman's ring and of the pallium, the meaning of what it means to be a shepherd and a fisherman. And one thing I might say today, one of the great challenges that almost every diocese we're dealing with is the question of evangelization. And when bishops talk to their priests, one of the things they try and encourage them to do is that we can't just be, we can't just look after the ones we have, but we have to do that. We have to go and evangelize. Mm -hmm. And these are the two elements that are clear in the life of a pastor. The shepherd who looks after the sheep he's already got, and the fisherman who goes out, as it were, to bring new fish in. A shepherd is a bad shepherd if he has more sheep at the end of the uh, night than he had at the beginning. So that means he's stolen them from somewhere, someone else. So the shepherd manages the sheep that he has and looks after those who are sick and who are lost, who have wandered off. And then the fisherman goes out and gets new ones. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, as a pastor, you have to do both. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's easier to look after the sheep. Sometimes the sheep are being unruly. You want to leave them behind and get new fish. But those two things are actually, they're not just symbols of Jesus the Good Shepherd, Peter the successor, or the vicar of Christ and the Pope is his successor, but those two images in the life of a pastor, to look after the flock, to keep it united and healthy, and then to fish for the new ones, to bring those who are, who are not yet in the flock. So these two images, one sort of you know agrarian and the other one from the sea, are essential to the life and ministry of a pastor. Well, we want to... Uh show you uh, something very special. It's a very special moment, really, in television history. A few months ago, EWTN interviewed Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Neither he nor we, of course, could have guessed that he would soon become uh, the Supreme Pontiff. It's a remarkable interview that gives us a real insight into the man who will be installed as Pope today. Take a look. Well, I don't know how it occurred to him. He must have felt that he had to do it. Certainly an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Because at one point, Paul VI had declared a year of faith during a very tumultuous time. 
Paul VI spoke the phrase, the smoke of Satan has entered the church. It was a very difficult time, and during that year of faith, wrote the beautiful Credo of the people of God. I don't think this time in history is more peaceful than that time, right? There is another path we can follow. The Pope often speaks of attitudes that, in their essence, are idolatrous, such as relativism, narcissism, consumerism, they are completely foreign to worship of the true God. Therefore, they are idolatrous attitudes, right? And in today's society, new idols are continuously established and driven by consumerism. Isn't that true? There is where people get hooked. Indeed, there is a strong need to renew the faith. To pray the creed with our hearts. To say, I believe in Jesus. In a similar way, the Pope teaches us what St. Paul told Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ. So in this year, remember Jesus Christ. Renew the faith. Revitalize it. Only Jesus provides the answer to this rampant idolatry, and he reigns from the cross. If we deny the cross of Jesus, we deny Jesus. One interesting fact about this paganism, it's a Gnostic paganism, isn't it? Yes, I believe in God, but he is just one God, a deluded God, almost a pantheism. But an interesting fact is the amount spent on non-necessities worldwide. Let's put aside spending on necessary things such as food and medicine. On those things that are not necessities or superfluous things, the greatest amount is spent on pets. The most unnecessary spending is made on pets. Pets are idealized. And there's the idolatry to buy, to rent, to have a feeling to give as I want, where I want, without needing a response. Isn't that true? It's all a caricature of love. And the second largest amount of money is spent on cosmetology, cosmetics. I don't remember exactly the amounts worldwide, but there are millions and millions spent on these two things. Meanwhile, the Pope is talking about children who are dying of hunger in underdeveloped continents like Africa, Asia, and America. First come pets, and then if there is something left, we throw it to the children. The Pope is talking about the beauty of the spirit, the beauty of the heart, that has nothing to do with the artificial beauty of cosmetics. We wear a costume when we don't have the beauty of God. Let's begin with this. The theological virtues are pure gifts, pure charisms, pure graces, which are given to you in baptism, and your soul is sealed with these three virtues. They come with the indwelling of the Trinity in your heart, but you cannot buy them or acquire them through your own efforts. They are pure gifts of God. Obviously, when we choose a path of self-sufficiency or a more Pelagian way, 
the gift takes a second place. And then faith is weakened, charity is weakened, and hope is weakened. So the most important thing is what I do. And here I remember a midrash from a 12th or 13th century rabbi around the time of St. Thomas. When speaking about the Tower of Babel, he explained how men, in their eagerness for progress, began well, but ended badly, and where the error was. To build the tower, they had to make bricks. To make bricks, they needed to find straw, make the mud, knead it, cook it. And so a brick had great value because it was the result of great effort. So when they were lifting the bricks and one fell down and broke, it was a tragedy because their loss was great given what they had invested. If a man were to fall, that wasn't a problem, since he was simply replaced by another slave. We can say that when we have this self-sufficient or Pelagian attitude, the virtues of faith, of hope and charity are diminished, and we end up neglecting the image of God that is every man, created in his image and likeness. Terminamos despreciando la imagen de Dios que es el hombre, creado a imagen y semejanza. Eso como línea general. Regarding the primacy of charity, clearly faith disappears once we contemplate God as St. Paul states, and hope is setting the anchor. Once we reach the shore, we remove the anchor and that's it. It isn't needed anymore. On the other hand, charity is the complete fulfillment of the seed planted in our baptism and that is why it endures. Our countries clearly have a great resource, a cultural resource and a spiritual resource, a resource that we can see in a few images that are common to all the people of Latin America que son general de todos los pueblos de América Latina. The images of Our Lady, the Mother, she who brings us to Jesus, she who is an image of the Church and who warms the home of the Church, and Christ crucified, who is sometimes presented near the cross as the Lord of Patience, after having been whipped and crowned with thorns. Or as the Lord laying down, dead. These are two images very dear to our countries, along with all the many devotions to the saints. But this resource refers to a God who became flesh and suffered for us. That is what those images signify. He came to us as man because of Mary who carried him, she who is mother of us all, and he dies for us to give us life. This reference is a resource that leads our countries forward and gives rise to the virtues of solidarity, assistance, understanding, and all of these things. This has not been destroyed yet, but all that this modern culture proposes including what is proposed in the centers of learning and what is proposed as social behavior, is eroding or tends to erode this. I think of this popular piety in the deepest sense of the word, in el hondo sentido de la palabra, ¿no? como la denominaba Pablo VI. As referenced by Paul VI in Evangeli Nuntiandi, or in the Aparecida document. This popular piety still has deep roots of faith and is very strong. And I bet on the faith of our people that our Lord will give us the grace through these practices of piety and obedience to Christ who died for us.
and that veneration of the mother can save us from this current, from this relativism where everything is equal. I would ask you, how do you pray? Yes, Father, I pray. I ask God. I give thanks to God. I ask Jesus for help. That's all. Only asking and giving thanks. I ask you about two types of prayer. Do you praise God? Do you praise God because He is so great as we do in the Mass, in the Sanctus of the Mass? But do you do that in your heart when you are in His presence? I ask another question. Do you adore God? Are you stunned before this great God and adore Him because He is the only God? To strengthen your faith, besides being a beggar, because we have to be very mendicant, the Catholic should be a beggar. Your prayer should praise and worship God. If you don't worship God, you will have something else. I don't know which one, a pet, cosmetics, I don't know. That was an exclusive EWTN interview with Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, the man who is now Pope Francis, the man we've just seen go around St. Peter's Square greeting the vast and enthusiastic crowds. And we want to thank Fernando Verano for conducting that interview for EWTN. Uh, before we discuss that, Joan, we're just seeing some incredible images of the Holy Father embracing babies, embracing the disabled, um, just having such an impact on the crowd. Sheer, I mean, joy, exuberance. He's now got out of the car, he's just kind of, and he's getting back in, we can see from images. How extraordinary that he got out of the car, goes over to say and hello to some people. And our may not have seen that yet because they're on a bit of a delay. In terms of and um, the fact, I have to tell you, I had an encounter the other day. If our uh, viewers recall, we spoke when the Pope after Mass went outside of Vatican City. And I, re I remember making the comment myself that, oh my word, I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of the head of the Vatican, Jean d'Arc. <laughs> well, I ran into Domenico Gianni about three hours after that, and he and he was had this wonderful, joyful look on his face. And I said, Domenico, how are you doing? We're all praying for you with this new pope who's just kind of going out into the crowd. And he said, John, he is wonderful. He's a wonderful man, and you know what? We're not worried. We're going to take care of this man, and we are very happy. Referring to the gendarmes. So, and obviously, it is part of the Vatican gendarmes, those men walking alongside the, the Jeep. But I have to tell you, the Pope looks like he's enjoying this just as much as all of those faithful. He certainly does. He's very uh, robust. He opted, or, or perhaps Vatican security opted, not to have the shield up, at least in St. Peter's Square in the Pope Mobile. And, and as we commented earlier, that he had a baby plucked out of the crowd to embrace, yeah. and then he stopped and got out of the Pope Mobile to go embrace uh, what looked like a disabled man. So, I mean, just uh, a true pastor's heart, I would say. Father Raymond? Well, it is uh, amazing to think that uh, last Sunday of Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio walked through the square, uh, very few would have even recognized him, and maybe some of those same Vatican security have asked him for his pass or where is he going and so forth. <laughs> right. So it's a remarkable transformation, and it's a great testimony to the importance of the office of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, these people are here to see the Pope, their new bishop. If it had been another cardinal elected, they'd have still been here, a new Pope, a new bishop. Now, you wouldn't have had the Argentinians quite so excited and so forth. So there are some, obviously, particularities. Uh, but that's the remarkable thing, is that this, uh, this whole grand stage, the Bernini's Columns, the Bermonti's Basilica, Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel, all of this is a stage on which is allowed to unfold the drama of 
Peter preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now we have a new Peter and the people obviously are quite uh, joyous, excited, and so is he. And in fact, you can see them running around if you look at the images in the square, which means that some parts of the square haven't quite filled up yet because there's so much um, security to get there's here, people are still uh, making their way in, as Joan mentioned earlier. Yeah, I don't uh, think it's earlier. for lack of interest, but no, I was surprised <laughs> at how many areas they were trying to keep completely blocked yes. off. Well, some were open for the mere presence of the Jeep being able to uh, yes. to pass through it. But it's, it's a day in which I, I've talked to so many Romans these days, the people that run restaurants and cafes and sell newspapers and so forth. Right. And there's an awful lot of people that because of what they've seen in the first few days, they feel a closeness to this man. He could be their older brother, their father, their grandfather. His humility and simplicity. People said, you know, I wasn't thinking of going on Tuesday to the Mass, but now I really want to. And so I, you're going to see a lot of that uh, Father, as well. Father Raymond, let's talk just a bit about this interview that uh, EWTN was blessed enough to have with uh, then Cardinal Bergoglio. He, he's a very direct speaker, isn't it? Yes. He speaks about uh, focusing on the cross. Um, you know, he, he's pretty pointed in his criticism of what he calls Gnostic paganism that pervades yes. the world today, uh, relativism. He even uh, focused on, on the incongruity between Christians focusing more on their pets and cosmetics than children. <laughs> yeah. and, and so he doesn't mince his words, does he? No, one of the things that's interesting they talk, uh, has been talked about, what difference does it make to have a pope from Latin America? Well, different cultures have different ways of speaking. Some are more discreet, some are more guarded, some are more subtle, some are more direct. And our friends here who are from uh, Argentina or who know Argentina have said that one of the characteristics of Argentinian public discourse is a certain directness. Like we might think, for example, that in, in Britain people speak English in a more reserved way, in Australia they speak it in a more direct way, that kind of thing. And when you notice when he speaks, uh, very even off the cuff or in an interview as we just saw, he talks about things like evil. Uh, he talks about paganism. He talks about consumerism. He talks about Christ without the cross is not Christ anymore. Very direct, and whereas we might be more accustomed to saying the same things, but in a little bit of a more subtle roundabout fashion, he comes out very directly. So perhaps one of the differences of having a pope from uh, Buenos Aires is we'll hear words uh, not the meanings of which we haven't heard before, but that direct language. Um, and as you mentioned, giving concrete examples there, as you know, in terms of pets and the cosmetics and so forth. So I think that's a cultural difference that we were going to have to become used to. Is a more direct way, uh, a more direct way of speaking. Bandict, of course, spoke with great clarity, but in a more reserved fashion. And now we have a different, uh, different Peter, different, uh, different style of preaching. A different teacher, you know, and it's very interesting when when he did speak of the amount of money that people spend on pets and on cosmetics. Um, he wasn't even trying to be funny because uh, when he was talking about the cosmetics, he said, this is being done, people are spending money on this while the Pope, because he was then Archbishop, while the Pope was talking about children dying of hunger in various parts of the world. That should not be happening where we give the priority to looking beautiful, to spending money on pets, and we don't save the lives of children. And then I do like what he said about the theological virtues. And he said, faith, hope, and charity are community virtues. And if we practice these, we will then be one in the image and likeness of our creator. But he said, the primacy of these goes to charity. And, and we've seen that so far, we've heard him talk about that, and I think that this charity, a, a viewpoint focusing on the poor, and I think divine mercy are going to be the words that describe his papacy. And I just want to remind our viewers that we're watching Pope Francis moving around St. Peter's Square uh, just before he begins his inauguration mass, uh, being received very warmly by the crowds here on a sunny, uh, beautiful day here in Rome. Uh, we've got the bells ringing behind us, and we've seen uh, Pope Francis stop the Pope Mobile several times just recently to grab a few babies from the crowd and give them a good kiss. Uh, <laughs> Father Raymond, he seems so person-centered, both in his words and in his actions. I suppose that's always the characteristic of a good pastor, but uh, do you see any particular gifts that he might already be bringing to this office? Well, one of the things that's just, uh, it's a bit strange to say this about a man who's 76 years old, but physical vitality. Um, 
Benedict himself, of course, on February the 11th, spoke about his how his strength was diminishing. Uh, but even he, he he inherited the See of Peter, as it were, inherited not the right word, but at the age of 78. And his own physical uh, sort of presence was always a bit more reserved, and he wasn't someone who liked to be jostled, uh, you know, sort of batted about. And so for eight years, Pope Benedict, and then for the last four or five years of John Paul's time, a very physically robust man when he was younger, but he was unable to do the kinds of things we saw today. So, right. you know, just in terms of 13 years since, say, the Great Jubilee, of having a more restrained physical presence, that the Pope was doing things like climbing out of the Jeep and going to greet people or walking out into the street. We, didn't, we haven't seen that for a while. So it, it's, in a certain sense, a, a new pope brings that sort of physical vitality, not just his intellectual or spiritual vitality. But it does reflect, obviously, in his body that he like, desires to be close to the people. And so I think we're seeing that, and that's, and that's uh, it's excited the uh, people, it's excited the Holy Father, and according to Jones' informed source, it, yes. it excites the security people too, <laughs> yeah, not, so that's exactly. good. And Joan, of course, we see a lot of uh, flags from Argentina, obviously, and that's to be expected. But we also have uh, so many heads of state here, people converging from all around the world, and so many dignitaries, obviously, in Rome for this occasion. What is it that brings so many to come here uh, and see this new, new pope and his inauguration mass. I and mean, what is it about the office and, and well, the chair of St. Peter? Precisely. It is the moral authority of the Holy Father. As Raymond said earlier, had another cardinal been chosen coming out today wearing white, he would be beloved and followed. And because he was pope, he would be this huge moral authority. And I, I listened to the words that uh, Francis has said so far, and in reading some things he said in Buenos Aires, and I think of him as being um, a voice for the voiceless. And that's what a pontiff often is, in this case, um, Francis. And you've got the world's leaders here. They don't go to a lot of events like this, but there's 131 delegations that have come. The delegations represent countries. They represent faiths. You have Buddhists, Sikhs, Jews, Muslims. Uh, any religion I probably failed to mention, and there's many, are, are present at this. And then the world leaders will meet, we know, with the Pope after Mass, when he goes into St. Peter's Basilica, he will divest, take off his vestments. He will then go to uh, just in front of the confessio um, under the uh, main altar, and that's where he will meet with the heads of state and, and government. So they will have their, their few seconds, and then he will, um, in coming days, address the diplomatic corps. Mm -hmm. So we will, get, <clears throat> excuse me, we will get that message as well. Here we see Pope Francis leaving the square now after a very jubilant and warm reception by the crowd for their new Holy Father. Father Raymond, what happens from here? He'll go inside the Basilica now. Uh, just to pick up on Joan's point briefly, one of the reasons all these heads of state are here is because even those who are not Catholic, even those who are anti-Catholic, even those who have no time, as it were, for the things of the spirit, I think everybody realizes that international relations, if they're only characterized by strategic considerations, only characterized by commercial considerations, something profoundly human is missing. So even for those who don't believe in Jesus Christ, who don't have time maybe even for religion, that, that there is a voice that speaks from the realm of the spirit and not from the realm of arms, the realm of money, the realm of uh, um, trade, the realm of, um, you know, sort of cultural domination. It speaks from the realm of the spirit. I think it enriches our international uh, relations, which is why all these uh, heads of state come, because somebody has to be the moral voice, or the voice for the spirit in the world. And it doesn't have to be, in a certain sense, if you're not Christian, the Pope of Rome. We believe that it has to be because he's the Vicar of Christ, but everybody acknowledges that somebody has to do it, and the only candidate at the moment is the Bishop of Rome. At the moment now, the new Bishop of Rome is in the Basilica, St. Peter's, or shortly therein. He will go and be vested in his vestments for mass, you know, his uh, chasuble and his mitre and so forth. Uh, then he will go with the Eastern Patriarchs. So he's gonna go down to the tomb of St. Peter. That's the, the confessio, which is that sort of, if you wanna say, hollowed out bit where you go down the steps in front of the main altar of St. Peter's. Uh, that's where the relics of St. Peter have been found in the 1940s when Pius XII ordered the excavations there. So he will pray there before the man whose successor he is. 
He'll be joined in the Confessio by the Eastern Patriarchs. That is to say that those, the heads of the Eastern churches that are Catholic, so they're not, it's not the Orthodox, okay. but these are the Eastern Catholic churches. So the Ukrainians, the Melkites, the Maronites, there's 22 of them actually. So, uh, and they are equally part of the Catholic Church. I say equally in, in um, quotation marks, not to disparage them, but because you know, you've got a billion Catholics and you know, five million of one or the other groups. However, they represent together the churches that make up the Roman Catholic Church. So the Eastern Patriarchs will be there, a nice symbolism of East and West, praying before Peter. And then after that moment of prayer, the procession will start, the Cardinals will come out onto the Sagrato, the steps in front of St. Peter's, the platform, and then the Mass will begin but before it begins, we have then the rituals of this um, inaugural mass. So before the mass begins, the cardinals, uh, representatives of the cardinals will make their obedience. Uh, one of the cardinals will bring the fisherman's ring, again, the symbol of the fisherman. One of the cardinals will put the pallium, the symbol of the good shepherd. And then there'll be uh, representatives of the cardinals who will greet the Holy Father. And then mass will begin. And then that's the mass of St. Joseph. Um, and the Pope will preach, I presume, on St. Joseph. Uh, and then otherwise it follows. One of the great things that is such a joy when you're covering an inaugural mass like this or a World Youth Day mass or canonization is that any Catholic who goes to mass, it could be Wednesday of the 31st week in ordinary time, it's mass, it's the same mass. It's a little grander, but you'll recognize, you'll know what's going on uh, in, from your local parish. And of the, when the Pope is at the tomb, they have chosen a total of 10 of the patriarchs, four of whom are cardinals to be with the Holy Father as they, as they pray at the tomb. And now what's very interesting, Vatican protocol is quite amazing and very, very efficient and very thorough. And just even the seating arrangements. So like on the left-hand side, at the same level as the papal altar, on the left-hand side uh, of this sagrato, or some call it the porch of the basilica, those will be bishops and archbishops from around the world and delegations from various Christian churches. And then on the right-hand side um, of, of the altar will be delegations from the various countries, including reigning monarchs, hereditary princes, so forth and so on. And then in the square on the um, St. Peter's side of the piazza, uh, St. Peter's Square, will be Jews, Muslims, members of, of other religions. And then on the St. Paul's side are, is the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See. So a very specific order, even among the diplomats, there is an order of seniority. You have your dean of the College of Cardinals, and um, they, their places will all have been carefully marked, and when they came through the basilica, they would have been escorted to those places. And we saw the president, uh, president of Argentina uh, there with whom uh, Cardinal Bergoglio, when he was cardinal, has, has tangled before over issues where he was defending church teaching very uh, strongly and, and encountering quite a bit of opposition. This is always, isn't uh, Father Raymond, a little bit uh, dicey sometimes? You know, we watch who's going to be sent from the United States and, right. and some who say, um, you know, who's going to be sent from each of these countries. Often we've got representatives of, of our uh, various nations that we don't right, think yeah. are, are really embodying uh, the best Catholic teaching. And, and so there's a lot of, um, you know, I would imagine that can be kind of a touchy situation. And from the Holy See's perspective, it's, it's also a state as well as a church. Yeah. Well, the, 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 one of the spokesmen yesterday, had a, he said, we don't invite anybody to come to this. <laughs> so we just tell the world what's going on. If they want to come, they're not refused. So to get, a, get around that problem, okay. uh, it was announced the Holy Father would not give communion. Uh, partly that's for simplicity of the ceremony, but partly I'm, I'm sure it's mostly that uh, that way, if he's sitting put in one spot, no one's going to say who got to go to communion, who didn't go to communion right. to the Holy Father. And it's true. I mean, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio spoke very frankly about the immorality of some of the policies of the president of Argentina. And she spoke very frankly about what she thought he could do with his opinions on those matters. And now she has to come here and put a smile on her face. And the same thing, the American cardinals are there and most of them uh, have spoken by name, uh, by policy, and even some by name about the policies of uh, that Joe Biden as the vice president supports. So these kind of occasions, part of the burden of being the world's moral voice is that sometimes people come to listen to you that you might not delight in but on the other hand that's the point they've come to listen to you so there is a bit of protocol and uh, not all the smiles you'll see today will be sincere most of them will be but not all <laughs> and a very important thing about Cardinal Bergoglio Francis 
is that he had an adamant policy against giving communion to pro-choice Catholics. So he was very strong so on that. So he was very, very strong on that. Will we? Uh, and, and I think the fact that Pope isn't giving communion out today, again, it could have been for, to simplify the right, the uh, length and so forth of the Mass, because there's other things in the Mass that have been changed. But this way, you do not have any pro-choice Catholic leader receiving, receiving communion. communion. You Pope. know what the world's well, not from the Pope, Father. but they, from they someone receive else, it. perhaps. Uh, they but might. I mean, <laughs> Yes, but not from the hands yes, of the Holy Father. And, that's, so. that, and that will be an interesting change because every country has its own sort of culture. And in Latin America, which is a dominant Catholic culture, uh, that is the Catholics are the majority, they have a certain approach to some of these questions that Catholics, the bishops of the United States or Canada do not have because the Catholics are a minority. And in Italy, there's a whole different ethos. There's a whole different ethos. I remember here when I was a student here, the mayor of Rome who was an ex-communist or still communist, but an avowed principled public atheist, and he would come to Mass and receive communion because he thought, well, the mayor of Rome has to do that. Even but aren't the rules the same everywhere in the church they in are, terms of canon law? They, they, <laughs> the, 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 the canon law is the same for all the church, but different cultures have different ways of living that. And so I think it's going to be an interesting thing for us to watch. And okay, you have a pope from Buenos Aires, and he did certain things when he was in Argentina. What will he continue and what might change for Italy? It's, it's, not, it's not as easy, it's, well, let's put it this way, it's easy for a parish priest in Wolf Island like me to say, well, they should do this or that, you know. Right. It's not as easy when you have uh, the complexity that we face here in Rome. So that'll be interesting to see how he will do that. He's meeting yesterday, the president of Argentina, he had a personal meeting with her. It was, he, he gave her a warm embrace, which is not usually offer, custom. Yes. Um, and she brought some particular drink, this mate drink, which yeah, I'm not really tea, familiar with what it is, but it, tea it's an Argentinian likes, yeah. tea, and she brought that for him. And, they, and then he invited her to stay for lunch. So, you know, there was a warmth there, even though obviously there had been, um, you know, differences in the past. But on the other hand, for a Catholic country like Argentina, to have a son of their own become Pope, the president of Argentina should be excited about that. It should represent the people who are excited. So even if she personally has clashed with him, I think she's correct to come and to be very warm and to and to represent the joy of her people. And likewise, Vice President Biden or the Governor General of Canada or Australia, they're not here to say, well, my policy is in conflict with the church teaching on this. They're, they're, they're here to say the people of the United States, the people of Canada, the people of Australia, the people of Great Britain, they're excited, and especially the Catholics, and I represent that joy here in my person. I think that's the best way to understand it. And you know, the church is always talking about dialogue. And, and if you have closed doors, you're not going to have dialogue. You can have differences of opinion, but that's what dialogue is for, to resolve those. Let's talk about this. If you just close doors and close the conversation before it's even started, then of course there's going to be even more, you know, bitter feelings and, and so forth. But one thing which I don't think we've mentioned yet is that among the delegations here today is Bartholomew the first, the um, patriarch of the Orthodox um, Patriarch of Constantinople, and it's the first time they've come for a ceremony like this since the schism of 1054. So he, they have not attended or been represented at other inaugurations of pontificates. So history is being made in that very respect. That's today. a very important thing. The Patriarch of Constantinople is the titular head of the Orthodox Church. Uh, he's in a very difficult position because vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Greece and so forth, his own position is not always stable. But Bartholomew and his predecessor have been very, had very warm relations. He comes, I would say every three or four years, he's here for the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. Mm -hmm. He was of course here for John Paul's funeral. Um, but Joan is correct, for the inaugural mass, this is the first time he's come. And he will be in, <coughs> excuse me, he will be down in the confessio praying with the Holy Father before the relics of St. Peter. So it'll be the Holy Father, the Eastern Catholic um, uh, patriarchs, but also the ecumenical patriarch, the Orthodox patriarch. So the head of the Orthodox Church will be praying alongside the head of the Catholic Church before the relics of St. Peter. And we're seeing the president of Italy arrive yes. here, Giorgio Napolitano. Right. Um, I want to go to the liturgy here because this is, uh, obviously we've, we heard just the other day um, 
Cardinal Pell had said that he thought that was one of the most significant legacies of Pope Benedict XVI. And when I interviewed him yesterday, he, you know, he said he hopes to see that reform of the liturgy continue under Pope Francis. But uh, as we know, papal liturgies are watched very closely um, and, and imitated in parishes around the world. So, Father Raymond, what do you expect to see and what would be significant in terms of what our viewers should be looking for where Pope Francis can kind of uh, make decisions that are going to have an impact. Well, you're absolutely right, Colleen. Uh, everything that he does is scrutinized, especially in these first few days. There's already been, and we talked a little bit about earlier in our coverage, about some of the things he did on the loggia on Wednesday night or in the Sistine Chapel Mass that were different than what Benedict did. And uh, with the liturgy, there's always someone who likes it, and right behind him is someone who doesn't. So it's always a balancing act. Um, Cardinal Pell and many of the cardinals like the fact that uh, Benedict emphasized that sort of reverence and formality. Uh, he was a reverent and formal person, so maybe that was easier for him. Uh, Francis, Pope Francis has shown himself to be a rather informal person, so we'll see about <coughs> how that is going to be. Can you maintain that sense of the reverence without even yes. if you have a more yes, informal you, personality. You, you can, but just like, you know, it's, it's like in a parish where one pastor leaves and the new pastor comes and says mass, perhaps 95% the same, mm -hmm. but everybody notices the 5% that's different. And so you have to keep a, we have to keep a balance of view that if 95% is the same and 5% is different, it's worth noticing. He obviously made a decision to make that 5% different. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the 95% is the same. So he is a reverent uh, celebrant of the Holy Mass. Uh, he might bring, I'm not sure today, it's his first Mass in St. Peter's Square, some changes. For example, one of the things that Benedict did is he introduced periods of silence after the homily and after communion for, uh, for silent prayer, which was not part of the John Paul II uh, program for large Masses. There may be things that Francis will add that, that as of yet we don't know. He has also simplified one thing today. We know he will not give out communion. The gifts are not going to be brought up by specific people to the altar. The deacons are bringing those to the altar. So we're not having a representative those, of each the, country. Exactly. Or, and the numbers of, uh, they said yesterday, 500 priests and deacons would be giving out communion. I must know, say, in and around the square. Uh, for my own part, it's just me. I'm a little disappointed about the procession, not the Oxford procession, because both with John Paul and Benedict, those are some of the most, if you want to say, Say, colorful, uh, colorful yeah. just lovely human moments because the you know the little children from Africa or little children from Asia with their native costumes or you know a family from Eastern Europe or you know a Latin American uh, you know delegation that come up and that bring the gifts and John Paul of course you know would uh, maybe embrace got them. too long yeah. he would bring they'd embrace them and Benedict would not be as expressive but he also he often a smile came up more often than not a smile on his face as he greeted yeah. the different ones who came so I Francis decided not to do that, and but I must say myself, I always like that as one of the nicer, if you want to say, um, it's a divine liturgy, but one of the more human elements, and I, I, I'll miss that today, and maybe it's just for today, but or maybe Francis thinks just for some given reason. Just the number of people uh, present, the length, in order not to have this be a, a, a three-hour mass or something. Do we know that each of these decisions is made by the Holy Father himself? We don't, I mean, actually. is that a safe bet, or could it be that he's been we, busy we, and, and they take over a few things? Well, in see, the he's new for Monsignor Marini at the liturgical office. Uh, Monsignor Marini is new, although Bergoglio, Cardinal Bergoglio would have seen um, his work from afar or up close. But um, I would have no doubts that there was some conversation be mm -hmm. between the two, you know, get his input. You're not going to take a new pope and impose everything on him. You are, of course, going to want um, you know his input, but I, I agree with you about the uh, the offertory procession, and I know one of the very poignant ma moments in the Christmas Mass, the Vigil Mass, because I was a reader once for John Paul, and um, th we had to go in the morning for practice. The only people who didn't practice were the children of diplomats, eight, nine, ten years old. We're going to bring up a floral bouquet and place it where this uh, baby Jesus was laying, which would then be brought out to St. Peter's Square. And one little boy, he was from Zaire, and he was all dressed in this gauzy white uh, uh, clothing from his country. And, but he had on Reebok shoes with flashing red lights. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and so as he walked away from the Pope, you could see the little flashing red light. Little humanity. Talk there. about a moment yeah, exactly. So. Uh, Father, what about the homily? What's the significance there? I mean, you said he'll probably preach on St. Joseph or May. Do you think he's going to stick to the script this time, or you think he might toss it down as he has uh, been lately? He, well, he may well do as he desires to uh, go off script. It's a little bit difficult to do that too much because, for example, just logistically, the Pope has his homily, which he'll preach probably in Italian, or at least mostly in Italian. That's been written out. That's been translated into different languages. All the diplomats and delegations will be have given will be in the front will be given that text. So if you've got someone who's representing the Anti Defamation League from New York, if the Holy Father gives us seven or eight minutes of extemporaneous Italian, he's a bit lost. So, uh, <coughs> so there's an advantage to staying to it. But Pope Francis has shown yeah. that he likes to go off uh, script, and he may well do so today. Um, Father we'll Lombardi distinctly and hinted at that. Yes. He may. We're now seeing uh, Pope Francis begin processing toward the tomb of St. Peter within the Basilica. This is, obviously, much of this is, of course, laid out for him, yes, given so. the history of this Mass. And do we know a bit about how this history has evolved um, over the centuries, Father Raymond? Well, the, the at one point they were called coronations because there was that crown, the tiara that was put on the Pope and that stopped after Pope Paul VI. He was crowned, but then his successor uh, was not. Uh, not least because Pope Paul VI actually sold the crown. So, you know, well, there are actually several crowns. Uh, so if you're in Washington, D.C., at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, down in the crypt, they have the crown, which uh, wow, Pope Paul VI sold, that. and the American Catholics purchased, and it's there. Uh, and the money went the, to charity. The, the, he sold it for charity. And the decision to lose the crown was to well, what, the, emphasize more the pastoral aspect of the office? It was, and also because the Pope uh, was no longer a temporal ruler. I mean, mm. he's the ruler of the Vatican City State, but, you know, that's a, almost a legal fiction. It's a very small, uh, right. it's less than a small city. But the, the principal elements um, emphasize those two things. Uh, the good shepherd, mm -hmm. shepherd of the flock universal, and the successor of the fisherman. So although different variations are made, th there's that kind of standard, um, uh, standard uh, if I say approach, and now we see the Holy Father, and the first thing you notice, is, as you said liturgically, is he's wearing the mitre he brought with him from Buenos Aires. It's not a Vatican mitre. Uh, many in the Vatican did not care for it on, uh, because they said it didn't really fit. So you see how Pope Francis had made sure it fits. He's brought a matching chasuble that goes along with it. So this is also, I'm sure, from Buenos Aires. Um, and then the, all the cardinals are there uh, waiting um, for him to go and do his prayers uh, there before the tomb of St. Peter. Uh, and then after he's finished praying before the tomb, uh, he will come out and all the cardinals who are already ready to go will then lead, uh, will lead him out onto the basilica uh, and, steps. And one interesting thing about the, the confessio, as you're looking straight down and under the main altar, you will see a niche in a wall uh, glass over it and covered by a grate. And during the year, January 21st is the Feast of St. Agnes, and um, her name sounding like lamb, <clears throat> excuse me, there are baby lambs that are brought to the papal apartments, and they have been previously blessed by Trappist monks who are raising the, um, but they're brought to the papal apartments, there's kind of another in blessing, the lambs are all decorated in bows and flowers and carried in the basket. The wool is, uh, when they're full, size lambs, baby lambs being under a year. The wool is shorn from them and made into the palliums. Mm. And then the palliums are placed in a receptacle in this niche, on the other side of which is the tomb of St. Peter. And they are then given to archbishops on the um, June 29th feast of St. Peter and Paul. Here we're going to uh now go live to the ceremony and the Mass for the installation of Pope Francis. Commentary for this portion will be provided by the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. Pope Francis will now incense near the tomb of St. Peter. An amazing scene to watch as this successor of St. Peter prays. 
to that first apostle to whom Jesus gave responsibility for his church. An unbroken line from St. Peter buried here to this man, Pope Francis, our new Pope. Now the two deacons will take from near the tomb of St. Peter the pallium, which Pope Francis will receive, and the ring of the fisherman, two signs of his papal authority. Last Wednesday, we heard from the main balcony of St. Peter's the Latin words that since the 15th century have announced a new pope, Annuncio Vobis Gaudium Magnum Habemus Papam. I announce to you a great joy we have a pope. And we heard that Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio had been elected pope and had chosen the name Francis after St. Francis of Assisi, one of the most beloved saints throughout the world. Pope Francis explained to journalists the other day when he, why he chose the name Francis. He said he was thinking of the poor. And he said, Francis is the man who gives us this spirit of peace, the poor man. How I would like a church which is poor and for the poor. Now we hear the choir and people singing Laudes Oregie, which contains the words written on the base of the large obelisk, the monument in the center of St. Peter's Square. Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus imperat. Christ conquers, Christ reigns, Christ commands. has sung the prayer for the Holy Church of God, beyond kingdoms, boundaries, binding together souls, be everlasting safety. And now they are praying to our Lord, the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. John the Baptist, St. Michael, and St. Joseph, asking their prayers for the church. Scola sings now for Francis, Supreme Pontiff, who gathers into one all peoples through doctrine in charity. Let there be grace for the shepherd and obedience for the flock. And the people then will pray, asking St. Peter and the apostles to pray for him. Pope Francis now joins the procession with the cardinals and patriarchs and other concelebrants. He's joined by over 130 cardinals today, 115 of whom 
in, during the clon conclave of last week, elected him Pope. As Pope Francis continues his procession, which is about two football fields from the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica to the front of the square, the scola sings, for Francis, Bishop of Rome and successor of Peter, who today begins his ministry, grant strength, the understanding of the Holy Spirit, and solicitude towards the universal church. And the people will pray the litany to the canonized popes from St. Cletus from the first century through St. Pius X who died in the 20th century. The choir now sings to our governors and all our fellow citizens praying with us. May true peace be in their hearts and fulfillment of their duties. And the people will again pray to the saints, saint martyrs and saints who are doctors of the Catholic Church, asking that they come to their aid.
the cardinals and Pope Francis have now reverenced the altar with a kiss. The altar symbolizes Christ himself. And the Holy Father now incenses the altar and the crucifix placed there to remind us of the centrality of Christ at this and every Mass. Now he incenses the beautiful image of the Madonna with child, an 18th century piece of art given as a gift by the then President of Brazil to Pope Paul VI in 1968. It's a beautiful day here in Rome. It rained all day yesterday and was quite cold and miserable. And this morning, the Romans awoke to a beautiful sunny day with nothing but blue skies and rather warm temperatures. Before the Mass actually begins, Pope Francis will receive the pallium and the fisherman's ring. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pax Vois. Deus Pacis, quae duxit. Cardinal Jean Louis Pierre Taran, the proto deacon cardinal says, May the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, bestow upon you the pallium taken from the tomb of the Apostle Peter. The good shepherd charged Peter to feed his lambs and his sheep. Today you succeed him as the bishop of this church to which he and the Apostle Paul were fathers in faith. May the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, grant you his abundant gifts of wisdom and eloquence in the ministry of confirming your brethren in the unity of faith. As the choir now sings from Psalm 68, God show forth which he has shown for you, and the strength of the Most High guard you. The pallium is the woolen collar worn by popes since the fourth century. It is a sign of authority, but the wool is a reminder that the authority comes only from Jesus, the Lamb of God. The wool is also meant to represent the lost, sick, or weak sheep, which the shepherd places on his shoulders. The pallium that Pope Francis wears today is the exact same pallium that was once worn by Pope Benedict. It has six small red crosses and pins are inserted into three of the crosses as a reminder of the nails that caused the wounds in each of the hands and the feet of Christ. Oremus. Bishop Daniels, Emeritus of Brussels, prays. Ubi recto corte de votaque mente invocaris supplicationibus ecclesiae tue quesumus ades. Let us pray. O God, who do not disappoint those who call upon you with upright and devout hearts, hear the fervent prayer of your church and pour forth your blessing upon your servant Francis, our Pope, to whom through our humble service you have granted primacy in the apostolic office. May he be strengthened by the gift of your Holy Spirit and worthily exercise his high ministry in accordance with the eminent charism he has received through Christ our Lord. 
and the people respond, Amen. The pallium the Pope wears is also worn by all metropolitan archbishops as a sign of unity with the Holy See and the full Episcopal authority. And every year on the solemnity of the Saints Peter and Paul, June 29th, each new archbishop receives the pallium from the Pope. Now Pope Francis will receive the fisherman's ring. Beatissime Pater, Episcopus et Pastor Animarum Nostrum. Cardinal Angelo Sedano, Dean of the College of Cardinals, says in Latin, Most Holy Father, may Christ, the Son of the living God, the shepherd and guardian of souls, who built his church upon rock, grant you the ring, the seal of Peter the fisherman, who put his hope in him on the Sea of Galilee, and to whom the Lord Jesus entrusted the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Today you succeed the blessed Apostle Peter as the bishop of this church, which presides over unity and charity, as the blessed Apostle Paul has taught. May the spirit of charity poured into our hearts grant you the gentleness and strength to preserve through your ministry all those who believe in Christ in unity and fellowship. The papal ring is called the fisherman's ring. It is sometimes engraved with the image of St. Peter fishing from a boat and encircled with the name of the Pope, a reminder of the gospel stories telling of the miraculous catch of fish after the Lord tells Peter and the disciples to let down their nets and to put, put out into the deep. Pope Francis's ring has the image of St. Peter with keys, as he is often depicted in art. The keys are a reminder that to Peter and the apostles, Christ gave the authority to forgive sins. The fisherman's ring is worn by all popes and is used to seal important documents. And at the death or resignation of a pope, that ring is immediately destroyed. Now six cardinals representing the College of Cardinals will come forward to show their filial respect and obedience to Pope Francis. And the choir will again sing, You are Peter. This is Cardinal Giovanni Battista Rey, the Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation for Bishops. Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone, Secretary of State and Camerlingo of the Apostolic Chamber. There are three orders or ranks of Cardinal. Two from each order are represented here today in this Abraccio, as they say, this sign of filial respect and obedience. The orders are Cardinal Bishop, Cardinal Priest, and Cardinal Deacon. Cardinal Martino is from the Order of Deacons. He's the President Emeritus of the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace. Cardinals have the title of eminence, and you notice they wear red. The reason they wear red is evident from the words they hear from the Pope when he names them and creates them a cardinal. He says to each one that the red signifies that you are ready to act with fortitude even to the point of spilling your blood for the increase of the Catholic faith, for peace and harmony among the people of God. The College of Cardinals dates back to the 12th century. There are currently 208 cardinals living in the world today. The Pope has said, Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries 
and all say together, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, Ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord, our God. And the Pope prays, May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Now the choir and people sing an ancient prayer in the Greek language which expresses our awe before the majesty of God and acknowledges our need for his mercy. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. Cantor intones the Gloria, glory to God in the highest. This hymn of praise is usually not sung during this season of Lent, but is so today for this occasion of the solemnity of St. Joseph. And the choir responds, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us.
For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Pope will sing, Let us pray, and so with him we also collect our minds and hearts in a recollected prayer to God the Father. Presta quesumus omnipotens Deus, ut humanae salutis misteria, cuius primordia beati Iosef, Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that by St. Joseph's intercession, your Church may constantly watch over the unfolding of the mysteries of human salvation, whose beginnings you entrusted to his faithful care. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Pope and the people are now seated to hear the Lord speak to each and every one of us through the written word of Holy Scripture. The first reading will be from the second book of Samuel, read in the English language. A reading from the second book of Samuel. The word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus the Lord speaks. When your days are ended and you are laid to rest with your ancestors, I will preserve the offering of your body after you and make his sovereignty secure. It is he who shall build a house for my name and I will make his royal throne secure forever. I will be a father to him, and he a son to me. Your house and your sovereignty will always stand secure before me, and your throne be established forever. Verbum Domini We now respond to the word we have just heard using words that God gives us in the book of Psalms. Today we hear from Psalm 89. The cantor will sing, His dynasty shall last forever. I will sing forever of your love, O Lord. Through all ages, my mouth will proclaim your truth. Of this, I am sure. 
that your love lasts forever, that your truth is firmly established as the heavens. And people respond, his dynasty shall last forever. covenant with my chosen one, I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your dynasty forever and set up your throne through all ages. The people again respond, his dynasty shall last forever. He shall say of me, you are my Father, my God, the rock who saves me. I will keep my love for him always. With him, my covenant shall last. And the people respond again, his dynasty shall last forever. The second reading will be read in the Spanish language. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, it was not through the law that the promise was made to Abraham and his descendants that he would inherit the world, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. For this reason, it depends on faith, so that it may be a gift, and the promise may be guaranteed to all his descendants, not to those who only adhere to the law, but to those who follow the faith of Abraham who is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into being what does not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, thus shall your descendants be, that is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. stand, the choir sings the gospel acclamation, praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. And Father Walter Volokin, a Greek Catholic, who teaches here in Rome at the Pontificio Istituto Orientale, asks for the Pope's blessing. The Pope blesses him with the words, may the Lord be in your heart and on your lips, that you may proclaim his gospel worthily and well, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
Today we will hear from the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Gospels are the authentic and divinely inspired accounts written by the four evangelists, Saints Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today on this special day, while the Mass parts are prayed mostly in Latin, the Gospel will be proclaimed in the Greek language, emphasizing the unity between East and West, a unity that is embodied in the person of the Pope. Sophia Orti, accuso mento agio evangelio. Rene passi. <coughs> the deacon saying, Wisdom standing, let us listen to the Holy Gospel. The Holy Father said, Peace be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The response is praise to you, O Lord, praise to you. Nistiftisis tis mitros aftu, Maria sto Iosif, prinis in eltinutus, e freti en gastri, e cusa ec devmatos agium. Iosif de oanir aftis, Dikeos on, que mi celon aftin digmatise, e politi laza polisen aftin. Tafta de uto... Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. 
When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. WTN's continuing live coverage of the inaugural Mass of Pope Francis. Father Volokhin now brings the Book of the Gospels to the Holy Father, who, upon receiving the book, will pray in silence through the words of the gospel, may our sins be wiped away. The Holy Father blesses the people with the book of the gospel, that these saving words may take root in our hearts. You'll notice that for the proclamation of the gospel, the Holy Father had removed his mitre, his sign of teaching authority, emphasizing that the Pope too listens and learns from the divine teacher, Jesus Christ. And now we will hear the homily of Pope Francis. Cari fratelli e sorelle, ringrazio il Signore di poter celebrare questa Santa Messa d'inizio del Ministerio Petrino nella solennità di San Giuseppe, sposo della Vergine Maria e patrono della Chiesa Universale. È una coincidenza molto ricca di significato ed è anche l'onomastico del mio venerato predecessore. Li siamo vicini con la preghiera piena di affetto e riconoscenza. Dear brothers and sisters, I thank the Lord that I can celebrate this Holy Mass for the inauguration of my Petrine ministry on the Solemnity of St. Joseph, the spouse of the Virgin Mary and the patron of the Universal Church. It is a rich and significant coincidence, and it is also the name day of my venerable predecessor. We are close to him with our prayers, full of affection and gratitude come pure i rappresentanti della comunità ebraica e di altre comunità religiose. Rivolgo il mio cordiale saluto ai capi di Stato e di Governo. I offer a warm greeting to my brother cardinals and bishops, the priests, deacons, men and women religious, and all the lay faithful. I thank the representatives of the other churches and ecclesial communities as well as the representatives of the Jewish community and the other religious communities for their presence. My cordial greetings go to the heads of state and government, the members of the official delegations from many countries throughout the world, and the diplomatic corps. In the Gospel, we heard that Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. These words already point to the mission which God entrusts to Joseph. He is to be the custos, the protector. The protector of whom? Of Mary and Jesus. But this protection is then extended to the church, 
As Blessed John Paul II pointed out, just as St. Joseph took loving care of Mary and gladly dedicated himself to Jesus Christ's upbringing, he likewise watches over and protects Christ's mystical body, the Church, of which the Virgin Mary is the exemplar and model. How does Joseph exercise his role as protector? Discreetly, humbly, and silently, but with an unfailing presence of total fidelity, even when he finds it hard to understand. From the time of his betrothal to Mary until the finding of the 12-year-old Jesus in the Temple of Jerusalem, he is there at every moment with loving care. As the spouse of Mary, he is at her side in good times and bad, on the journey to Bethlehem for the census and in the anxious and joyful hours when she gave birth. Amid the drama of the flight into Egypt, and during the frantic search for their child in the temple, and later in the day-to-day -day life of the home of Nazareth, in the workshop where he taught his trade to Jesus. Nella costante attenzione a Dio, aperto ai suoi segni, disponibili al suo progetto. How does Joseph respond to his calling to be the protector of Mary, Jesus, and the Church? by being constantly attentive to God, open to the signs of God's presence, and receptive to God's plans, and not simply to his own. This is what God asked of David, as we heard in the first reading. God does not want a house built by men, but faithfulness to his word, to his plan. It is God himself who builds the house, but from living stones sealed by his spirit. Joseph is a protector because he is able to hear God's voice and be guided by his will. And for this reason, he is all the more sensitive to the persons entrusted to his safekeeping. He can look at things realistically. He is in touch with his surroundings. He can make truly wise decisions. In him, dear friends, we learn how to respond to God's call readily and willingly. But we also see the core of the Christian vocation, which is Christ. Let us protect Christ in our lives so that we can protect others, so that we can protect creation. La vocazione del custodire però non riguarda solamente noi cristiani. Ha una dimensione che prende e che, che precede e che è semplicemente umana. Riguarda tutti. The vocation of being a protector, however, is not just something involving us Christians alone. It also has a prior dimension which is simply human, involving everyone. It means protecting all creation, the beauty of the created world, as the book of Genesis tells us, and as St. Francis of Assisi showed us. It means respecting each of God's creatures and respecting the environment in which we live. It means protecting people, showing loving concern for each and every person, especially children, the elderly, those in need who are often the last we think about. It means caring for one another in our families. Husbands and wives first protect one another. And then as parents, they care for their children. And children themselves in time protect their parents. It means building sincere friendships in which we protect one another in trust, respect, and goodness. 
tutto è affidato alla custodia dell'uomo. In the end, everything has been entrusted to our protection and all of us are responsible for it. Be protectors of God's gifts. Quando non ci prendiamo cura del creato e dei fratelli, allora trovo spazio. Whenever human beings fail to live up to this responsibility, whenever we fail to care for creation and for our brothers and sisters, the way is open to destruction and hearts are hardened. Tragically, in every period of history, there are Herods who plot death, wreak havoc, and mar the countenance of men and women. Please, I would like to ask all those who have positions of responsibility in economic, political, and social life, and all men and women of goodwill. Let us be protectors of creation protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature, protectors of one another and of the environment. Let us not allow omens of destruction and death to accompany the advance of this world. But to be protectors, we also have to keep watch over ourselves. Let us not forget that hatred, envy, and pride defile our lives. Being protectors then also means keeping watch over our emotions, over our hearts, because they are the seat of good and evil intentions, intentions that build up and tear down. We must not be afraid of goodness or even tenderness. Here I would add one more thing. Caring, protecting, demands goodness. It calls for a certain tenderness. In the Gospel, St. Joseph appears as a strong and courageous man, a working man, yet in his heart we see great tenderness, which is not the virtue of the weak, but rather a sign of strength of spirit and a capacity for concern, for compassion, for genuine openness to others, for love. We must not be afraid of goodness, of tenderness. Today, together with the Feast of St. Joseph, we are celebrating the beginning of the ministry of the new Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, which also involves a certain power. Certainly, Jesus Christ conferred power upon Peter. But what sort of power was it? Jesus' three questions to Peter about love are followed by three commands. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Let us never forget that authentic power is service, and that the Pope, too, when exercising power, must enter ever more fully into that service, which has its radiant culmination on the cross. He must be inspired by the lowly, concrete, and faithful service which marked St. Joseph. And like him, he must open his arms to protect all of God's people and embrace with tender affection the whole of humanity, especially the poorest, the weakest, the least important, those whom Matthew lists in the final judgment on love, 
the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and those in prison. Only those who serve with love are able to protect. In the second reading, St. Paul speaks of Abraham, who hoping against hope believed, hoping against hope. Today, too, amid so much darkness, we need to see the light of hope and to be men and women who bring hope to others to protect creation, to protect every man and every woman, to look upon them with tenderness and love is to open up a horizon of hope. It is to let a shaft of light break through the heavy clouds. It is to bring the warmth of hope for believers, for us Christians like Abraham, like Saint Joseph, the hope that we bring is set against the horizon of God, which has opened up before us in Christ. It is a hope built on the rock, which is God. To protect Jesus with Mary, to protect the whole of creation, to protect each person, especially the poorest, to protect ourselves. This is a service that the Bishop of Rome is called to carry out, yet one to which all of us are called, so that the star of hope will shine brightly. Let us protect with love all that God has given us. I implore the intercession of the Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, Saints Peter and Paul, and Saint Francis, that the Holy Spirit may accompany my ministry. And I ask all of you to pray for me. Amen. Holy Father and people now stand to sing the Creed, which is the Church's response in faith to the gospel just proclaimed. The words of the Creed contain the faith of the apostles themselves, the same faith for which countless men and women have dedicated their lives and even shed their blood, not only in the past, but even today. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man.
for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. And the life of the world to come. Amen. Following the creed, the Holy Father will lead us in the prayer of the faithful. In this intercessory prayer, we pray for the church and for the needs of all mankind. Holy Father says, Dear brothers and sisters, the Lord God is our salvation. Let us raise our prayer to him for the needs of the church and our world. The cantor sings, Let us pray to the Lord. And the people respond, Lord, hear our prayer. The deacon sings in Latin, let us pray for God's holy church. In the Russian language, we pray, may Almighty God, by his faithfulness, confirm us all, pastors and faithful alike, in wholehearted obedience to the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Deacon says, let us pray for Francis, our Pope. In the French language we pray, may Almighty God by his grace watch over him in his ministry as the successor of the Apostle Peter and pastor of the Universal Church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for government leaders. In Arabic, may Almighty God, by His wisdom, enlighten their minds and lead them to help build a civilization of love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the poor and the sick throughout the world. In Swahili, may Almighty God, by His providence, grant them refreshment, comfort, and hope, not least through the love of their brothers and sisters. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for God's family gathered here today. In Chinese, may Almighty God, by His holiness, transform the lives of us all and make us ever more like the Lord Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And Pope Francis concludes by praying. Lord God, 
You look with constant kindness upon your sons and daughters. Receive the prayers which your church lifts up to you with gratitude and confident trust through Christ our Lord. Amen. The deacon intoning our prayers was Deacon Dan McCann from the Archdiocese of Sydney. He's a deacon who studies and lives at the Pontifical North American College here in Rome. The many diverse languages used at these papal masses for the readings and the prayer intentions reflect the universality of our Catholic Church. During this simple offertory procession, the choir sings, Tu es pastor ovium, you are the shepherd of God's flock, a song composed by the Italian Pierluigi da Palestrina, of the 16th century. During his homily, Pope Francis challenged us to be good and tender. He asked, how does Joseph respond to his calling to be the protector of Mary, Jesus, and the church? By being constantly attentive to God, open to the signs of God's presence, and receptive to God's plans and not simply to his own. What an appropriate day for this inaugural Mass, being the solemnity of St. Joseph, the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary and guardian of Jesus. Since 1870, when declared by Pope Pius IX, St. Joseph has had the title of patron of the Universal Church. Not only does St. Joseph protect the church by his prayers, but he is a good model for this and any pope who, like St. Joseph, humbly and in simplicity accepts God's mysterious plan and the mission he has been given. The choir you hear is the Pontifical Music Choir of the Sistine Chapel, directed by the Salesian priest, Father Massimo Palombella. The tradition of having a dedicated choir for papal liturgies goes back to the Scola Cantorum of St. Gregory the Great in the sixth century. The Holy Father incenses the gifts of bread and wine and now incenses the altar itself. As the simple bread and wine placed on the altar are gifts offered to God, all here ministers and people also offer their lives to God in this same sacrifice. Since the Pope, the deacon will now incense the people assembled.
The Holy Father prays, Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. People respond, May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. We pray, O Lord, that just as St. Joseph served with loving care your only begotten Son, born of the Virgin Mary, so we may be worthy to minister with a pure heart at your altar. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, and on the solemnity of St. Joseph to give you fitting praise to glorify you and bless you. For this just man was given by you as spouse to the Virgin Mother of God, and set as a wise and faithful servant in charge of your household. To watch like a father over your only begotten son who was conceived by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him the angels praise your majesty, dominions adore and powers tremble before you. Heaven and the virtues of heaven and the blessed seraphim worship together with exaltation. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in humble praise as we acclaim. You will now hear the choir and people sing the Sanctus, a song of praise, drawing from the words of the prophet Isaiah and also recalling Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem before his passion and death. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We are now entering into the significant moment of the Mass where through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the words of Christ, the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we will together listen with reverence. The Holy Father asks God to bless the gifts presented in praise for the Church and for Himself. Una con me in nino famolo tuo, con ecclesie tuo e prese voluisti, et omnibus ortodoxis ad quel catholici et apostolici fidei cultoribus. Memento Domini. Cardinal Angelo Sudano, the Dean of the College of Cardinals, prays for those gathered here and for all the living. Proquibus tibi offerimus. Velquiti vi offerunt to sacrificium laudis, pro se suisque omnibus, pro redemptione animarum suarum, pro spesalutis et incolomitatis sue, tibi qui reddunt vota sua, 
eterno Deo, vivo et vero. Kodnarai, Patriarch of Antioch of the Maronites in Lebanon, unites our prayers with the prayers of all the saints, especially this day with Joseph, the husband of Mary. Set et beati Joseph, e iusdem virgins sponsi, et beatorum apostolorum, ac martyrum tuorum, Petri et Pauli, Andrei, Jacobi, Ioannis, Tome, Jacobi, Filippi, Bartolomei, Mattei, Simonis et Taddei, Lini, Cleti, Clementis, Xisti, Cormeneli, Ciprias, Aure Laurenzi, Crisogoni, Ioannis et Pauli, Cosme et Damiani, et omnium can sanctorum tuorum, quorum meritis precibusque que concedas, ut in omnibus projectiones tui, muniamur auxilium. Pope Francis now asks God's blessing on the gifts, and then he and the concelebrants will say the words of consecration by which the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Quan oblationem tu Deus in omnibus quesumus benedictan, adscriptan, ratam, rationabilem, acceptabilemque face de dinieris, ut nobis corpus et sanguis fiat dilectissimi fili tui, Domini nostri Iesu Christi. Qui pride quam pateretur, cepit panem, y santas ad venerabiles manus suas, et elevatis oculis in celum a te Deum Patrem Suum Omnipotentem, divi gracias agens, benedicit, fregit, dedicoe discipuli suis dicens, accipite et manducate es hoc omnes, hoc est enim corpus meum, Quod probovis tradetur. Simili modo, posquan cenatum est, accipiens et un preclarum calicen, in santas ad venerabiles manus suas. Iten tibi gracias agens, benedicte, dedicto discipuli sui dicens, accipite et vivite ex seo omnes. Ic est enim calis sanguinis mei, novi ed eterni testamenti, qui provovis et promultis e fundetur in remissionem peccatorum. Hoc facite in meam commemoration. Mysterium fidei. The mystery of faith. People with celebrants and concelebrants respond. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. The Holy Father and the concelebrants now commemorate the saving acts of Jesus Christ, his passion, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension and they ask God to be pleased with and to accept these offerings. Iuten Christi, fili tui, Domini nostri, tam beate passionis, 
nec non ab inferis resurrecciones, sed in cielo gloriose ascensiones, oferimus preclare majestati tue, de tuis donis sagratis, ostiam puram, ostiam santam, ostiam immaculatam, panem santum vite eterne, et calicem salutis perpetue. Supraque propicio a sereno bulto respicere dignieris, et accepta avere sicuti accepta avere dignatus es munera pueri tu i justi abel, et sacrificium patriarche nostre abrae, et cotibi optulis sumus sacerdus tuus melchisedec, santum sacrificium immaculata nostrium. Suplice te rogamus, omnipotens Deus, Iube ec per ferri per manus santi angeli tui, in sublime altare tuum, in conspectu divine maestatis tui, ut quod exalis altaris participazione sacrosantum fili tui corpus et sanguine sum serimum, omni benedizione celesti e grazie e reclamo. Cardinal Daniels will now commemorate those who have died. Memento etiam Domine famulorum famularum quetuarum, qui nos peceserunt cum signo fidei, et dormiunt in somno pacis. Ipsis Domine, et omnibus in Christo quiescentibus, locum refrigeri lucis et pacis, ud indulgias de precamur. Cardinal Turan prays that trusting in God's mercy and love, we may share in the fellowship of the saints. Cardinal et omnibus sanctis tuis, intra quorum nos consorcium, non estimator meritis et venie, quesumus, largitor admite, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Per quem, ec omnia Domine, semper bona creas, sanctificas, vivificas, benedicis et presta nobis. Per ipsum et cum ipso et ipso est divideo... The Concelebrants pray, through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Per omnia secula seculorum... And the people respond, Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
people respond, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit. The deacon sings, let us offer each other the sign of peace. Pope Francis turns to the cardinals and offers them the sign of peace. And the people offer each other that same sign of peace, the peace that the world cannot offer, but that only Christ can give. watching EWTN's continuing live coverage of the inaugural Mass of Pope Francis. Ecce agnosei, ecce quitoli peccata mundi. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. The Pope says with the people, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. In receiving the body and blood of our Lord, the Holy Father prays quietly, May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. You see there are many, many priests here on hand, about 500 who will help to distribute communion throughout the large square and to the other faithful who are overflowing into the Via della Via Conciliazione. They're accompanied by seminarians from the Pontifical North American College with white umbrellas, a reminder of the presence of Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Almost all of the 250 seminarians and new priests at the Pontifical North American College, as well as the faculty and rector are here at this mass this morning, involved in the mass in some capacity. Choir sings an antiphon from the Gospel of Matthew from the first chapter. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her.
priests and deacons who are distributing Holy Communion today say to the faithful, Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, to which each person responds, Amen, a Hebrew word often used by Jesus, meaning yes, what is said is true. The word Amen takes on even greater meaning during this very special year of faith, opened by Benedict XVI on October 11th of last year, the day that also marked the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. And so this year of faith is a wonderful opportunity for Catholics to turn toward Christ, encounter him in the sacraments, and rediscover the faith of the church. The faithful who take part in this liturgical celebration today in St. Peter's Square can obtain a plenary indulgence, which is the full remission before God of the temporal punishment due to those sins which have already been absolved in confession. And with this, our merciful and benevolent God, through his church, dispenses and applies the merits of Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all the saints in order to remove from us the lingering effects of our forgiven sins. To obtain this plenary indulgence, one having received the Holy Father's blessing, must reject all attachment to sin, and then within several days go to sacramental confession, receive Holy Communion, and pray for the intentions of the Holy Father. This indulgence, as all indulgences, can be applied to oneself or in charity to the souls of the deceased.
week at EWTN's live coverage of the inaugural Mass of Pope Francis, and I'm joined by Father Raymond D'Souza and Joan Lewis. Father Raymond, what were your thoughts on the homily that we heard from Pope Francis? It was very simple. It was very brief. Uh, he spoke uh, in a very Franciscan way, invoking St. Francis of Assisi himself. He devoted most of his attention, actually, to protection, the theme of protection of St. Joseph's a protector, and spoke extensively about the environment. I think in the secular world, the headline will be, you know, uh, in, in Green Pope uh, is inaugurated in St. Peter's. I think what's interesting is that this was the homily, this was the famous Be Not Afraid homily of John Paul II, the inaugural mass of October 22nd, 1978. There was a reference to that. Uh, Francis did say, we must not be afraid of goodness and of tenderness, you know, so they pay tribute to that. It was also the famous homily of Pope Bennett when he said, do not be afraid to let Christ into your life. He takes nothing away from you, but gives you everything. So in a certain sense, uh, Francis had a two tough acts to follow. I think what's notable here is that the words were not particularly memorable, but the passion with which he spoke is memorable. And that might be his distinctive contribution. And when he spoke about protecting the weakest, the poorest, uh, those who are at the margins of our heart and of society, then you could feel the passion in his, uh, in his preaching he, in, when he spoke about Matthew 25 and how we would be judged. So I think that would be my, my sense of, of uh, his preaching style is that it's the passion with which he delivers the words uh, that will be, that will remain with people long after the Mass. And Joan, like, like me and like Father Raymond, you stepped into the square uh, when we were on break here just to get a feel for what was happening there. What's your sense? Just the awesome nature of the whole day. I was there for the consecration. And the minute the bells rang after the Holy Father pronounced the words of consecration, the gendarmes, anybody in uniform, clicked their heels together. You could hear that almost as clearly as the bells and stood at attention and people's heads bowing. But, you know, I have to tell you, out of the homily, I got three things. A description of how Francis wants to be as Pope, where he talked about Joseph, and he said Joseph was discreet, humble, and silent with an unfailing presence and utter fidelity even when he finds it hard to understand and he talked about being there for Jesus and Mary every moment with loving care and then there was and we don't have time for this now but I know we'll talk about it later his talk to world leaders a great because it, it was creation but part of creation is man is people he stressed tremendously the duty of him as Pope and of the world's leaders in protecting people and there's one phrase that's going to be a title on my blog I think his pontificate is going to be a horizon of hope he used that several times I think it describes I feel for me Joan Francis is for me a horizon of hope and I, I could feel that in the square. I think we certainly That's all felt that. That's the theme, actually, that, uh, that, as Joan points out, a very a great point of continuity. Uh, Pope Francis mentioned Pope Benedict. It's his name day, St. Joseph, the beginning of the Mass. But that argument, Pope Benedict developed very clearly over the years that if we respect the order of creation, if we desire to protect the environment, we have to protect the order that we find in the human nature and uh, and man's place in creation as well. So that's a nice point of continuity between Pope Francis's inaugural homily and many things that Pope Benedict said. It was interesting in all nine of those references to the creation or the environment, he also had uh, very close by references to uh, the human person in, in different words each time, but clearly connecting those the two order, themes as yeah. Father Raymond pointed out. Thank you, Father Raymond D'Souza and Joan Lewis. Since they first met Pope Francis last Wednesday, the people of Rome have become quite enamored with him. They are flocking to his Angelus, to this Mass, hanging on to every word he says. Whether you speak to a taxi driver, a waiter in a restaurant, a bus driver, a priest, a prelate, everyone is very fond of this Pope, Pope Francis. He's the first pope ever from the Americas and the first Jesuit pope. He was born Jorge Mario Bergoglio in Buenos Aires, Argentina on December 17, 1936, one of five children of Italian immigrant parents. In 1958, he joined the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, 
the order founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola in 1534. And Pope Francis spent his initial years with the Jesuits as a professor of literature, psychology, and philosophy, and ordained a priest on December 13, 1969, and professed his perpetual vows on April 22, 1973. And for the Jesuits, he served as novice master, as provincial for Argentina, as rector of the seminary, and he received his doctorate in Germany in theology. In 1992, Blessed John Paul II nominated him Auxiliary Bishop of Buenos Aires. And in 1998, he became Archbishop of Buenos Aires after serving for eight months as coadjutor Archbishop. During the consistory of February 21, 2001, Blessed John Paul II created him a cardinal. As a cardinal, he has served on several congregations of the Roman Curia, and as president of the Bishops' Conference of Argentina from 2005 until 2011. Pope Francis is already known for his great intellect, his love for and attention to the poor, his devotion to Our Lady, his simple lifestyle, his life of prayer, his courage and leadership. You see, again, the large facade of St. Peter's Basilica off to the right are parts of the Vatican Museum which lead to the Sistine Chapel, where of course last Wednesday we saw the white smoke come from the chimney. It was a rainy, chilly night, but again the piazza was packed with people cheering on our new Pope Francis. Attendance today are many members of the Roman Curia, also 33 delegations representing Christian churches and ecclesial communities, and over 132 countries are represented with delegations here today. There are 16 members of important Jewish delegations and other faiths, six reigning sovereigns, 31 heads of state, three crown princes, 11 heads of government. And you see by the flags, the whole world, in a sense, has come to St. Peter's Square today, not only here, but by means of television, radio, and internet to be part of this exciting event. Let us pray. Defend with unfailing protection, O Lord, we pray, the family you have nourished with food from this altar, as they rejoice at the solemnity of St. Joseph and graciously keep safe your gifts among them. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the Holy Father will give his final blessing. Dominus the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. 
et filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Deacon McCann sings, Ite Misa Est, go forth, the Mass is ended, and the people respond, thanks be to God. and people now sing the traditional Catholic hymn to Mary, Salve Regina. They sing, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet, Virgin Mary. sings what is called the Te Deum, the ancient Catholic hymn of joy and thanksgiving dating back to the fourth century. As the Holy Father joins the Cardinal and other concelebrants, returning back into the Basilica. After this Mass, the Holy Father will meet with, briefly with various delegations sitting up there on the Sacrada, the top portion of St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis had has already had some full days. He began his first full day as Pope, entrusting himself and his pontificate to the Blessed Virgin Mary, praying to her at the Church of Mary Major, and placing flowers on the altar below the image of Mary as protectress of the Roman people. Then, as has widely been reported, he went to thank the staff at the Casa del Clero, where he had been staying before the conclave, also to pay his room bill. Thank you to the Pontifical Council for Social Communications for their commentary. Watching the Mass with me have been Father Raymond D'Souza and Joan Lewis. Father Raymond, your reflections on what we saw and heard today? It was a beautiful Mass, a beautiful, simple, 
warm beginning to the Petri ministry. I couldn't help but think that St. Francis of Assisi, who had that great poem, The Canticle of the Creatures, and talked about Brother Son. We've been here, Joan, Colleen, for about two and a half weeks. It's been miserable almost every single minute of every single day, and <laughs> we've finally had a lovely day. And, and thanks be to God, to St. Francis and St. Joseph for sending off their, uh, sending their Pope, their new Pope out with, uh, with the beauty of creation, which was a theme of the homily today. So it was a beautiful day, beautiful, uh, beautiful St. Joseph's Day here in Rome. And, and I can't help but think that today is the culmination of what has been several weeks of, but a orderly, peaceful transition. And, but part of that is still history because Francis's predecessor is probably watching this. That kind of blows my mind, really, <laughs> when I think about it. So, I mean, there's been history, there's been mystery. The going into conclave, the importance of the Holy Spirit playing a role in, in the cardinal electors, getting a new pope. So history, mystery, but again, a, a wonderful continuity, very, very orderly. And all I could think of, because um, I've read them like six times today, at the end of his wonderful homily, the pope quoted St. Paul, who speaks of Abraham, who hoped against hope and believed hoping against hope, and now this is where I feel for us. Today, too, amid so much darkness, we need to see the light of hope and to be men and women who bring hope to others. The, the three of us in our lives, the, the tens, hundreds of thousands of people behind us, that's what the Pope's asking us to do today. I and believe very, we've done that here. A very hopeful day and end of a few uh, rather hopeful two weeks. Colleen, what thoughts do you take away as we come to the end of this extraordinary uh, fortnight here in Rome? Well, it's it's been such an honor and joy to be here in person to witness this and to bring this to all of our viewers. I think, you know, I'm very excited by Pope Francis. I think he's going to be a pope who focuses our attention on Christ. And I think he's going to be one who challenges us, particularly perhaps those of us in North America, materialism, um, attention back to poverty and simplicity, and uh, always Christ at the center and Christ crucified. That's what I've seen and heard in his messages. And I think that's a gift to us, a challenge, but a gift. And, and the perfect way to introduce us, introduce the church to that is in Holy Week, which, yeah. Pope Francis will begin literally in five days. So he'll be back in the square on Palm Sunday and, and then we'll really see him develop those themes, I think. So it's been, it's been a blessing to be here. It certainly and, has. And we're gonna hear a huge amount more, we've heard of a lot of it in five days, of Christ, God's love and mercy. I, I don't think he's ever gonna tire telling us not to give up on God's love for us. It is always there, it is greater than we can possibly imagine, and so is his mercy. And he said it several times in several homilies, never underestimate the power of God's mercy and never stop asking for it. Mm. Oh my word, the bells. Now again. we hear the bells. Plenum. Father Raymond D'Souza, Jill and Lewis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Colleen. Our privilege. Well, that's all for now. I'm Colleen Carroll Campbell, and it's been our privilege here at EWTN to bring to you these historic events of today and the past few weeks live from the Vatican. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support and thank you for your prayers. They mean a great deal to all of us here in Rome and in Birmingham. Today we have a new Pope installed on the chair of Peter. Viva Papa Francesco.